Hello guys, welcome to the Medical AI Lab AI Research Intensive Lecture 9, setting up a cluster. I am Chen Wei and today I'm going to be walking you through the lecture. So first, let's look at our learning outcomes. So after taking this lecture, you'll be able to first know the routines of working and coding on a remote cluster, including adequate use of Unix commands, screen and code editors, port forwarding to work in a Jupyter environment. And second, you'll be able to run jobs in interactive sessions and batch jobs, as well as requesting resources, including GPU resources, and you'll understand how much GPU resources you need and how to handle out of memory issues. And in the end, you should be able to transfer data and files from locally to cluster and vice versa. So first I'm gonna show you a motivating example. So suppose you recently started a deep learning research project and you would like to utilize the remote computing clusters so the schools provided. So you've registered your cluster account and enabled dual authentication. So how would you log in and maneuver yourself to the remote Linux systems to set up the basics repo of the project? So first, um, we're gonna talk about how to log into the cluster. So once you have a cluster account, you can log in and submit jobs. So um, like the most usual way you can connect to the cluster is to use SSH, which stands for secure shell at the host name. So here um, we're using O2. So it will be o2.hms.hover.edu. If you're on Linux or Mac, you can use the native terminal application. If you're on Windows like I do, you will need to install a program to connect to O2. Here we recommend using mobile X term. So in either terminal or mobile X term, type the following command. SSH your account at o2.hms.harvard.edu. Then you go ahead, um, let me actually show you. You type in your password. It's invisible here. And you're gonna select your preferred way of logging in. So for me, uh, I'm gonna do a phone call. And uh, after the no. authentication, you can just go ahead and sign in. Yeah, so here we are. And so some of you might wonder, um, what is a shell and what is a terminal? and what are different kinds of shells and terminals. So first, uh, let's talk about what is a shell. Simply put, the shell is a program that takes in commands from the keyboard and gives them to the operating systems to perform. In the old days, it was the only user interface available in a Unix-like system such as Linux. So nowadays we have um, graphical user interface, which stands for, uh, which is short for GUIs. And in addition to command line interfaces, CLIs, such as the shell. So most Linux systems program called bash, which stands for born again shell, an enhanced version of the original Unix shell program, SH, written by Steve Born, acts as a shell program. So besides bash, there are also other shell programs available for the Linux systems. These include KSH, TCSH, and ZSH. So the main ones used here are um, Bash and ZSH, with um, ZSH having some advantages over Bash. So uh, what is ZSH and how does it perform better than the original Bash? So there are some very obvious uh, differences in functionalities. So first, automatic CD, um, which means automatic change of directory. You just take, type the name of the directory instead of of um, having to type CT. Also, um, is has um, recursive path expansion. You don't have to type the whole name. You can just um, do um, u slash lo slash b instead of user local bin. You also have spelling correction and approximate completion. If you make a minor mistake typing a directory name, DSH will fix it for you. And it also includes plugin and theme support, it includes many different um, plugins 
frameworks. And here's a quick guide to you um, how to access and use CSH. So um, on Mac, if you have homebrew installed, which I strongly recommend you do, you can simply run this one line, uh, brew install CSH. And on Windows is a little bit more complicated. Um, so uh, you have to first enable the Windows subsystem for Linux, the WSL, and install a Linux environment. And then you do sudo apt-get install ZSH and, and launch directly using WSL ZSH. You can also have um, bash automatically switch to ZSH whenever you launch it. So you don't have to manually do it again. So in order to do this, you have to um, edit your .bashrc file. So bash basically runs this command in this file every time it starts. You can make the edits using any text editor you like, including VI, but we'll explain the process using nano. So first you're gonna open the dot bash RC file in nano, run the following command, nano dot bash RC, which means opening the file in a nano editor. And then you're gonna um, add the following lines uh, here. But, um, but this uh, is gonna make sure that bash only launches ZSH um, when you open a bash window. This avoids causing some problem for other softwares. And next we're gonna talk about what is a terminal. So a terminal is called a terminal emulator. This is a program that opens a window and lets you interact with a shell. There's a bunch of different terminal emulators we can use. Some Linux distributions install several. This um, might include genome terminal, console, xterm, um, rxvt, kvt, nxterm, and eterm. So as you can see here, um, a hardware um, talks to the kernel OS, and shell is a basic the wrapper um, to wrap the OS system. And terminal is the text input and output environment that interacts with the shell. And um, yeah, and user can directly operate on the terminal. So next important concept we're gonna cover is pass. So what is a pass? Whenever um, you run a command or any program, the computer has to know where to look for it, right? In order to find the program, because it won't just look in every directory that's gonna take too long. It's only gonna look at the ones you specify. So how does it know to um, look in the directories mentioned above? So for example, um, if you type Python, it automatically runs Python instead of you specifying um, the place you installed Python. So how does it manage to do that? It is simple. There are part of an environment um, variable called um, dollar sign pass all capitalized, which your shell checks in order to know where to look. So um, yeah, sometimes you may wish to install programs into other locations on your computer, but able to execute them easily without specifying the exact location, like our Python example just mentioned. You can do this easily by adding a directory to your dollar sign pass variable. So in order to see what's in your dollar sign pass um, right now, you can type this command, echo pass into your terminal. Don't forget the dollar sign. So this is gonna show you different passes that's gonna be checked. You can append to the pass using export pass equals to dollar sign, um, parenthesis surrounded PWD. This means your current directory and dollar sign pass. So this is gonna uh, append to the start of your current pass, which is ideal. But um, what happens if you restart your computer or um, you create a new terminal instance? So your addition to the pass is gone, and this is by design. The variable pass is set by your shell every time it launches, but you can set it that it always includes your new pass with every new shell you open. So the exact way to do this um, 
depends on which shell you're running. If it's bash shell, then you're gonna change your dot bar bash RC file. If it is ZSH shell, which we just introduced, you're gonna run your edit your dot ZSH RC file. <clears throat> so um, to actually save changes to the configuration file, you have to run the file uh, by running source uh, dot bash RC. And here's a little example. So let's say you wrote a little shell script um, called hello.sh and you have it located with, um, with a directory like can be any directory. So this script kind of provides some useful function to all the files in your current directory and you will like be able to execute no matter what directory you're in. So by simply adding the place with the file to the pass variable with the following command, export pass equals to dollar sign pass um, and, and, the, and the pass. So two things to notice here. So first, you don't need a dollar sign um, to the first pass, before the first pass. And second, you shouldn't put, put any spaces around the eco sign. Otherwise, there's going to be problems. Yeah, and this is um, basically what we just mentioned to make permanent changes instead of just, you know, um, re-editing the, um, re the pass every time. You're going to change your bash RC file. And uh, a lot of times you're not sure which shell you're running. So if you're using pretty much any common Linux distribution, haven't changed the default, chances are you're running bash. We can confirm this with a simple command, echo dollar sign zero. Okay, so um, next let's get our hands on some basic shell commands. So um, first um, a waiver, a notification that we're skipping some very common commands. Um, for example, like CD uh, is basically change directory and put a space and the directory you wanna change to. And PWD, uh, it doesn't have a lot of variations. You just type PWD and it's gonna give you um, give you the current working directory. And also um, CP, um, I think the only um, thing to notice is that if you want to copy the subdirectories and all the files under a directory, you're going to specify uh, cp r. And also rm uh, is very straightforward. So we're going to skip all those and talk about like useful stuff. So first, um, we're going to cover OS. So um, OS is very simple. It's just uh, list contents. Uh, and so here, I'm gonna show you some uh, very useful options for this. Uh, so first, um, S, uh, actually lowercase s, lists the file sizes, and uppercase s, sorts by the file sizes. Lowercase d um, shows you the directories. And uh, so for example, if you use ls, um, hyphen d, asterisk, and forward slash shows you every folder in the current directory. And because uh, uh, the reason we add that uh, asterisk and forward slash is that uh, that means like the current directory. And these stand for directories, uh, another name for folders. That's how it works. And so lowercase t, sort by date, uh, uppercase x, sort by extension, and um, Lowercase l, list with long format, it actually shows permissions, which is super, super important. So we're gonna cover a little bit more here. Um, yeah, so here's a quick example of um, LSLH, and which is very, very important, and you're probably gonna use like a, a whole bunch of times. Um, so here's an example output. And we can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven columns. And let's start from the easiest one, like the right side. So this column stands for the file names. 
and this is the last modified date, and this is a file size, um, which just shows the total size of the folder of the file. And uh, here, the group means uh, information about who can access the file. And owner provides the creator uh, information of the file. And uh, the file type uh, here, um, the first field, um, it may, if it's uh, like a like a hyphen, like a simple hyphen, it means it's a plain file. If there's a D, uh, which isn't the case here, it means it's a directory. Um, if it's a C, it represents a character device. If it's a B, boy, it represents a block device. Okay, so other fields are pretty self-explanatory. I'm not gonna dig too much into that. Um, so permissions, uh, you may wonder, like, what are those? These are so complicated, but these can be divided into three parts. The ownership, the group, and the other. So um, what do you mean like um, three parts? These are colored into yellow, blue, and yellow. Let's look at it. So first, um, they kind of follow the same syntax, you know? Uh, so R stands for read permission. W stands for write permission. X stands for execute permission. So the octal values um, are used to represent permissions. Uh, for example, four stands for read, two stands for write, and one stands for execute. So if a file has um, seven, six, four permission, what does it mean? So this means the owner can do all operations on one on the file. Uh, and meanwhile, the group can do read and write operation on the file. And the other can only read the file. So you may also get confused, like what is seven, six, four? Like I don't see any here. And don't worry, uh, I'm gonna show you like the file permissions um, in absolute mode, uh, which means the uh, kind of mapping octal value to the um, <clears throat> to the um, RWX value. So you can see here um, RW hyphen, which means read and write permissions, right? So the now we know the owner has read and write permissions. And here we have R hyphen hyphen for both the group and the other. So this means both the group and the other users only have R hyphen hyphen, which is read permission only. So the permission for this file um, in the octal value version is 644. All right, we got it. <clears throat> So next, um, the next important um, aspect is um, the lowercase pass. It's kind of different than the environment variable we just covered. Because um, this pass is also like a pass to a file, but it's more in general. Like it, it doesn't have to be environmental. It has to, uh, it could be like any file, any directory. And one important idea is having a full or in other words, absolute pass versus having a relative pass. So an absolute pass is defined as specifying the location of a file or a directory from the root directory. The root directory means from the start. So um, sometimes you um, say PWD, uh, let me actually give you an example to understand this better. Yeah, so this is like the root um, from the start. So you can see there's a forward slash um, here. So if we PWD, this is definitely an absolute pass. It's a complete pass from the start of the actual file system um, on the root directory. And what is a relative pass? So that's OS, oops. Let's like make a directory, um, 
track to like example one two three all right so uh let's um see, let let's for for example let's just cd there right example one two three so how does it know like i'm gonna go there because i am currently at the home directory oh sorry i'm not at the home directory but i'm like the, at the default directory and the subdirectory of example one two three can be directly accessed because i didn't put a forward slash so the computer knows um, the path is related to my present working directory, right? Oh, sorry, it's PWD. And uh, so this is the absolute path and um, and simply example one, two, three was the relative path. And so let's see, see, it doesn't work because if you put a forward slash in front of it, it's going to think, OK, this is going to be the full pass, while it is only a relative pass. And next, uh, another two uh, very useful command. So um, first, man stands for menu. And uh, it basically tells you um, what is like a um, what is like a menu for like a certain command. And also there's a, another um, tree command. It basically prints a tree of the file structure. So it displays the directory structure of a path of or of the disk in a draft graphically. The structure displayed by this command depends on the parameters that you specify at the command prompt. So if you don't specify a drive or path, um, the command displays a tree structure beginning with the current directory of the current drive. Uh, so let's cd to our example one, two, three, and let's do tree. Yeah, so there's nothing there. Um, zero directory, zero files. And um, so basically, the syntax is here. You first do tree. And then you specify the drive, uh, which here we don't have because we're on a, um, one disk Linux system. And pass uh, specify the directory for which you want to display the directory structure, which we uh, ignored because we want to print the current directory. And um, also there's F, which this, uh, you can swap, which displays the file names of the files in each directory. And there's also A, you can specify to use text characters instead of graphic characters. It shows the lines that links subdirectories. And there's also a um, uh, question mark, which um, displays help at the command prompt. OK, yeah. So yeah, this is also very useful. Also, it's like a simple idea. So we have like a lot of files, right? And so for example, that's like long, long, long name. All right, so because um, every time we log in, we're like at the, we're here, at the starting, like the default directory, right? So what if we wanna like, let's say we just type in example one, two, three, then we LS, then we don't wanna like, typing this every time, right? It's such a huge waste of time. So what you can do is, um, if there's like only one file starting with L, you just type L and you press tab, it's gonna auto complete for you. You don't have to write this whole long name. But let's say like we have um, two files, um, we have like another long, long name. So if here, we press L, it's not gonna show us a full pass, right? Because there's two starting with long. So you just have to um, press, like type another L so the, so the shell knows it's, it's this, not that one. Yeah, it works. And uh, so next, uh, I'm gonna give you some introduction 
to another another four actually uh, very useful commands. Sorry, give me a second. Yeah, and these are cat less um, tail and head. So cat stands for catenate. Has many uses and printing the contents of files onto the terminal is one of them. So um, it's gonna show you what a certain file contains. So um, the easiest way to examine a file is just to um, print out all its contents using the command cat. You can test this by um, printing out like random stuff here. Let's see, what do we have? Uh, so for example, cat gen data py. Yeah, so this basically shows us like everything here in this uh Python file. So it prints out all of the contents of this Python file um to the screen, and uh it shows you what this file contains. But cat is not perfect, and we'll see. Yeah. Sorry, I think I have a lecture night folder here. Yeah, yeah, I do have it here. Oh. So cat is a terrifically good command, um, but when the file is really, really big, it could be really annoying, you know. So in practice, when you're running your analysis on command line, you'll be most likely dealing with large data, large files. And in our case, uh, we just made some random ones. And let's take a look at the list of files. And um, at the um, H modifier, actually the LH, LS, LH, we just talked about and see how big those files are. Okay, yeah, the, these are pretty, pretty uh, s small. Yeah, uh, if you remember like the permission stuff we just talked about. Yeah, so we can see, yeah, there's like some differences in the file size and imagine these are gigabytes, terabytes. They're not gonna like open um, and just see like everything, right? So let's do cat requirements. Yeah, see like this one is just very, very long. And yet, like sometimes it goes over the limit of like a terminal, so you can't can't even see the whole file, and you can't scroll up. So um, how do we um, how do we solve this? Um, we're gonna use less. Less uh, is a command that lets you um, use a shortcut keys to move through your large file, and you can explore these files um, more freely compared to the cat file. Uh, sorry, the cat command, which uh, simply just uh, prints stuff out. So let's do less requirements.txt using the tab completion, which is learned. Yeah, and uh, so we use space to move forward, we use B to go backwards, we use G, go to the beginning, um, capital G, go to the end, and in order to quit, press kill. So this is uh, much, much better um, than the um, cat command. And there's another way we can look at files uh, and just look at the start of them. So in particular, if we want to just look at the beginning or end of the file to see how it's formatted. For example, like, uh, like is it like a, like a regular uh, NumPy file or is it like stored in kind of like a data frame version. Yeah, so these commands are head and tail and they just let you look at the beginning and the end of a file respectively. So for example, let's do head, um, same file requirements. Yeah, this gives you um, the head of it. And um, by default, the first or last, oh sorry, last, 10 lines, um, it'll be printed to the screen. So let's do the tail, yeah, it's the same. 
and uh, not too much to talk about here, but there's certainly one option, hyphen n. So for, for example, like if you do like two lines, requirements, yeah, it prints out two lines and same for tell. Yep, and uh, yeah, and that's it for um, ball viewing and maneuvering. And uh, great, so next uh, we're gonna talk about another useful tool in our um, Nix system, it's called Vim. So it's a text editor, maybe you have heard of it and it has a pretty not good reputation of being complicated, but it's actually not because we're gonna learn it today. Um, it offers like great functionality, but it just takes time to become accustomed to the interface and learn the shortcuts. So, but after all, why do we use Vim? Because in all POSIX systems, Vim is a default fallback editor. It's gonna be sure to be open, whether you have just installed the operating system or have you like booted it into a minimal system repair environment or you're unable to access any other editor. Also, it's extremely customizable because um, it takes a long time to master. I'm not even um, confident enough to say I'm a pro in Vim. And most importantly, you can only use keyboard to control it. So um, let's actually go through some um, essential commands for VI or Vim. And uh, let's try. So for example, uh, yeah, touch is also like a very useful, uh, useful command is for creating files. Vim.txt, all right, so we vim. Vim.txt, it could be any name, it doesn't have to be vim.txt. Yeah, so here uh, we're in the basic mode, the default mode, which doesn't allow us to like directly typing one, two, three. I'm like touching one, two, three on my keyboard, but nothing shows. Because this is because we have to change into the insert mode. So we press I, oh, it's insert mode, one, two, three. Yeah, see? And uh, we can like use or enter our backspace like usual. What if we go too long? Like, all right, we um, press ESC and um, go back to the basic mode and and we do GG to uh, move to the, oh, sorry, my, my command line is a little bit frozen, my bad. Yeah, sorry, it's a little bit frozen. Yeah, th this one's busted, sorry. It's like completely not working. Let me just reconnect to it. Give me a sec. Yeah, so meanwhile, um, I'm gonna also talk about like, how do we actually, oh, my bad. I'm gonna have to do the phone call instead of other uh, two options. Okay, yeah, this is taking too long, so I'm gonna skip and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, so basically GG moves you to the top or or like uppercase G to the bottom of the file. And uh, so so remember, all these are should be in default mode, okay? And also, um, how do you save the file? Um, you basically go back press ESC, go back to the basic command mode and press um, WQ. And remember to include the 
First column. Yeah, it finally shows up. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Sorry for the delay though. Vim, vim dot txt. Yeah, because there was like a, it was like a issue. Great. Yeah. So let's do gg. See, we go to the top of the file, and we do caps lock g. We go to the bottom, and uh, what do we have? Like a super long line, right? We first, yeah, see, and we press um, dollar sign. Oh, sorry, yeah, dollar sign. It's zero, and we want to delete this DW entire line DD. U undo undo. Control R redo. And what do we want to save it? WQ. So it basically just quits everything. Yeah, so if we go over Vim. Oops. Yeah, there was some bug with uh, my previous session. Okay, yeah, now it's frozen again. It's not good, but yeah. We'll just ignore it. So um, next, uh, we're going to talk about grep, uh, redirecting, and pipelining. So simply put, grep is a command line utility for searching plain text data sets for lines matching a pattern or regular expression, which, which is rejects. So um, first, the reason that we use um, grep is a shortened form of globally searched for a regular expression and printing match lines. So yeah, as usual, let's first look at the syntax of grep. Um, it has several um, options. B and A will be very useful because it returns a match line plus one. Before, before one is B, uh, two lines after is A, and lowercase n, which prints out the line number from the file for the match. And the last script option you may find useful is a lowercase v version, which does an inverted match. This will return everything that doesn't match the pattern. Yeah, so, um, sorry, my, my session is still frozen. So, oh, it comes back, nice. Yeah, because we can see after WQ, like we saved stuff we printed. So we can do a quick grep. Um, tutorial here. Yeah, see in this a.txt, we have a lot of like ASD and SAD, right? So we want to do grep, uh, print the before line two, after one, and the line number, and SAD which is the search term and the file name b.txt. Great, yeah, so you can see we have what we need. And uh, some of the lines are printed, you see like doesn't have ASD, oh, sorry, SAD, it's because we specified the before and after, so we can know the context better. Yeah, we kind of need a speed up here. So when we use grep, uh, the matching lines print to the terminal. Um, if the results of the grep is only a few lines, we can fill them easily. If they're very long, the lines will be keeping printing, won't be able to see anything except the last few lines. So like, if we do like A here, it's, it's, it's like quite long, right? You might have experienced this, like um, when you're doing some like searches for common words. So for example, if you're gonna search like, and um, then in like a genetic sequence, it's gonna give you like a lot of Lot of stuff. So what we do here is um, we use a redirection command for appending something, and so it's double um, the 
greater greater than sine. Yeah, and you can also do single, but um, let's see the difference. So result.txt, right? And cat result.txt. Yeah, and but what if I want to do it twice and pen it? See, it doesn't append. If we do double, we append instead of overwrite. Now it appends. We have like two uh same results. And we can also redirect uh with pipelines. Uh, so redirecting a uh, command is similar to the uh, redirection command. So the only difference is it uses the output of a command um, as an input for the other command. Yeah. So here WC uh, L is like the word count. Let's let's just do it real quick here. Yep, we get the word count, and the L option stands for lines, which matches. We have twenty two lines. Yeah, so now we're gonna cover what is a HPC cluster. So HPC clusters have um, like a lot of components as yes, logging nodes. The servers where the users connect remotely and from, where they can submit jobs to the cluster. No memory or CPU intense process should ever be executed on the logging nodes. In O2, we're strictly limiting CPU and memory access on logging nodes. So intensive um, processes executed on logging nodes will mostly likely be killed or have a very poor performance. Computing nodes. These are servers designed specifically to support intense memory and CPU processes, as well as special resources like GPU. So any job correctly submitted eventually is dispatched by the scheduler on the first available compute node. The storage server is a system of servers storing the data on the cluster. And scheduler um, main task manages the cluster computing resources and to dispatch job on different computing nodes. So here's some um, other terminologies. So the first lines, these three words, just fancy words for a computer. Master host, um, systems that acts to perform all the coordination. Submission so host, um, remember when we log into o2.hms.harbor.edu, you end up um, logging into like a logging node. So yeah, that's like the submission host. Execution host is just another name for a compute node. Partitions, partitions are queues. So when submitting a job, we're gonna show it like shortly right after, you'll need to specify a partition to submit your job to. If you're not sure which partition to use, um, like um, I'm not gonna cover it here because it's O2 specific, but yeah, do choose uh, wisely uh, according to how many GPUs you're gonna use. Yeah, file system is just a fancy word for a big disk drive. So let's look at our motivating uh, example two. Suppose now you have the basics of the repo set up, you're ready to start Devon. So how would you create sessions, request resources, and set up the environment for a Jupyter notebook? So let's look at Asbatch. So Asbatch uh, basically submit a batch job. It's non-interactive. And SROM, SROM basically runs interactive sessions. And SQ views your status of your jobs um, submitted by SBatch. And uh, yeah, SCancel basically cancels the job. And SInfo shows you the node and partition information. So yeah, let's uh, look at some examples. Um, so first, uh, SROM interactive sessions. Uh, we're gonna do this one first. We're still in a logging node, remember? So basically, as wrong, I request is 12 hours, uh, partition to be interactive, CPU to be four. This enables um, like stuff related to um, Jupyter Notebook 
but it's not going to work because we didn't specify when we SSH'd. Yeah, but yeah, so this is not working because we didn't specify uh, when we uh, connected. So let's see this one. So same uh, differences. Uh, we had like GPUs. Uh, memory is like the GPU memory. Yeah, so after we submit this, it's going to wait and uh, yeah, it's going to be quite long because we requested for a GPU. To not waste resources and time, we're just going to cancel it. Yeah, so we can see here as wrong is used for starting interactive sessions or job steps. Uh, so when used for interactive session, it creates a new job allocation, you can see here, and it's going to wait for resources. And SBATCH are for submitting jobs. So instead of like getting into like a interactive session, when you do all the same commands, you um, define what you're going to do, and you submit the job, then you can go like turn off your computer and just wait. It's going to be keep on running on O2. And yeah, let's uh, look at... Uh, what these are. Um, so first, um, this line is a must. So this S batch, you specify um, how many CPUs you need by hyphen C, how many time you need, memory per GPU, um, which GPU partition, and um, GREs uh, equals to GPU four. Yeah, and uh, you're gonna do like all the like change directory and loading stuff because it's not it's it's like similar to starting a new um session entirely, and um you're gonna um write your sron command here, so I'm not gonna explain this because this is our project related, and yeah, then you just dispatch uh your dot sh file. And if you don't want to specify all this, you can also put them uh, here, but it basically just uh, works the same. So the sbatch command uh, submits the job to the slurm followed by the scripts, which is here. So this entire script is wrong underscore 3kg1.sh. So I'm gonna uh, spend a little bit more time on Spatch's um, um, argument options. So n is um, and it, it works the same for Sron. So n is the number of tasks requested, and uh, c is the number of the CPU cores requested. Mem is the memory we reserved. Mem per CPU. Is for CPU memory, and T is the time. Yeah, and also most importantly, P for the partition. Okay, cool. So we do have resources, but we have resource limits. We're not gonna request like a hundred um, GPU every time, right? So um, yeah, uh, what is the RAM? So RAM acts as the workbench on which the computer puts all the active processes and softwares. So every time we load up a new program, it gets bundled onto the RAM for the computer to use. So what is a VRAM? So VRAM is a video RAM on which the graphic processor stores data on which it's doing computation. So um, um, like we're gonna see, uh, sorry, how much to request. Uh, so if we're usually dealing with like NLP data, you don't need that much because um, texts are small. Usually like four to eight GB VRAM for GPU is more than enough. When it comes to um, computer vision, like image data, we're probably gonna need a lot of VRAM. So I usually like, do at least six, like a lot of times like 20 like or like 16. So it's gonna be um, fewer limitations when you actually run the job. Okay, so... Um, yeah, next, uh, how do you want to lock the GPU utilization? So first, um, WNB and also Neptune, those are great packages for monitoring GPU. 
and you can view it on a web page. And but we're not gonna cover it here. Um, this lecture we're gonna stick to the Linux use. So um, yeah, here. Uh, this is a normal um dot sh bash file like like we just did. So here we specified everything and we load our environment, and then we're gonna use run this um, gpu monitor dot sh. See, there's an end sign. So with the end sign, the process starts in the background. So we can continue to use the shell. Do not have to wait till the script is finished. Yeah, let's walk this through. Uh, what is it? So echo basically means print. Well, true, because it's going to keep running um, until the um, job is finished. We echo um, the NVIDIA SMI, which is a command to check uh, what are the current GPU usage and sleep five minutes. Um, so it um, checks like every five minutes and uh, also, it checks if the job is doing something else and exit if not. And if there's no other processes um, detected, then it's going to terminate the GPU monitor. Yeah, so you can you can basically like copy all these commands and um, put it in your own um, cluster use. And yeah, put it just put it after the asbatch script, you're going to run jobs and it's going to um, be very useful. Okay, yeah, and uh, next we're gonna give you an example of using a Jupyter. We are not actually gonna install Jupyter here. We're gonna jump, because that's covered by another lecture. We're gonna jump straight to how do we um, connect um, to Jupyter Notebook. So remember when we run this here, it didn't work, right? Because we didn't specify the ports when we logged in. Yeah, so um, we're gonna need to um, connect to O2 with um, these flags. Yeah, a number of programs with graphical user interfaces like use X11 forwarding. Uh, so we can also do like XY. Yeah, but anyway. Uh, If we connect like this instead of like the regular SSH O2 dot HMS dot harbor dot edu, uh, let me get a phone call and do it again. OK, cool. No worry. Oops. Ah, it was taking so long. Sorry, it just, it just takes so long. Yeah, so uh, in order to save time, because we have more stuff to cover, basically you add this port um, when you connect, and then you can run um, interactive sessions. And in this format, you're going to specify your tunnel, which should uh, be exactly matching the tunnels you specify when you connect. And uh, then you can run um, Jupyter in your um, compute node. And our last motivating example is um, moving files. So imagine you have some local data you want to upload to the cluster. And you also have some results you want to download to the local. So how would you set up the file transfer? So if you only have a single file to copy, you're on Mac, you can run this command, like the following from the terminal application. So um, scp my file. And my O2ID at transfer rc.hms.edu. So basically, this is like this can be also applied to non hubbard um, places. So you basically, uh, this should be replaced with your login email, and um, this should be replaced 
with um, like the um, location you want. And yeah, so experienced users can also set up batch copies using rsync or recursive CP. So um, yeah, basically you can do a as batch and um, specify the partition and the time and use wrap um, to um, load up the rsync command. So rsync my directory one, my directory two. So this could be the source and this could be the destination. So the rsync can be useful um, to run on slow and unreliable connections. For example, if your internet is really bad or like your file is like two terabytes and you don't want to like be interrupted by by like a, like a naughty friend or your cat, you know? So you can use uh, the P option. Usually I do like rsync VP. So it preserves partially downloaded files and also shows proxies. So if it's ever interrupted, you can just run this again and it's gonna um, get you back from where you, where you were interrupted. And yeah, so um, what if you wanna keep coding during the file transfer? So um, screen is like a very useful command. Uh, let me actually show you here. There's some examples. So screen, um, OS, oh sorry. Screen OS, you can see uh, there's a screen. And uh, screen, we're gonna start a new session, uh, like new, yeah. And uh, control A, D. Yeah, now we quit it, because uh, we detached using these commands. So basically, um, screen allows you to um, operate like a, another kind of like a small image like thing. So it provides the ability to launch and use multiple shell sessions from a single SSH session. So when the process is started with screen, it can be detached from the session. It could be also reattached to the session. So detached and Attach means like whether you are switching to the screen session you created at a later time. Yeah, so here's some user commands that we just showed. You attached and you, you can attach by name. And there's the ultimate attach. Uh, so it attached to the screen session. If it's attached elsewhere, just attach the other display. And these are some like shortcuts. Um, C means control, like C and hyphen means control. So control A, like, um, and um, then you press D quickly, uh, it's gonna detach you from the session. And also CA, like access all the program in screen, which is not recommended. And yeah, and basically that's it for today. And thank you very much for our lecture night, um, getting familiar with the cluster and thank you, bye.